resolution, physical definition, is the minimum resolvable distance between two distinct targets. So here, delta is the resolution. Um, and if, it's, if the targets are too close, we can't resolve them anymore. So minimum distance here is the definition of resolution. And if you look at the uh, range direction resolution and azimuth direction resolution, uh, they're different in a way that range directional resolution depends on the pulse length. If the pulse length is too wide and you cannot resolve these two points, but azimuth uh, directional resolution depends on the beam width, you can see, right? If the beam was too wide, you can't tell if the enemy plane is here or there. So you want to make it make the beam narrow, as narrow as possible. You can also see that range resolution doesn't depend on the distance because it's pulse length dependent, but azimuth resolution linearly scales with distance because the width is uh, fixed, but as you travel farther away, this swath width gets larger and larger. Now let's look at this antenna uh, at the front side of the antenna. Uh, in this case, rectangular antenna, it's a face array antenna, and we talk about aperture. And what is aperture? Aperture, if you think about your camera, aperture is basically opening, right? Uh, in this case, it's large aperture, medium aperture, and small aperture in your camera. Just like that, in antenna, uh, the opening dimension is the aperture. And there's an interesting property of this aperture, opening dimension, and the radiation pattern of the antenna. Uh, it's a directional dependence of the amount of energy or amplitude uh, and expressed in terms of angle in radian. Um, the antenna pattern looks like this. And it turns out it's exactly the same as the Fourier transform of the antenna shape itself. So if you imagine plane wave propagating from behind of your screen towards you, and antenna aperture is the window, and what you expect to see measure after this window is this radiation pattern. And there's an important property between these to antenna aperture and radiation pattern, uh, which is what is called similarity theorem. Basically, it says that um, there's an inverse linear relationship of the dimension of the antenna in one direction and the dimension of the radiation pattern. Basically, if you have long, longer dimension in X, radiation pattern gets a narrower dimension in X and vice versa. Okay, with that in mind, let's put that our antenna on, in space. Uh, and if you look at the three-dimensional look of radiation pattern, it would look like this. I have a main lobe as well as, as side lobes, right? Because of the diffraction, you have that. And then some radar jargon here, when the radar, uh, the satellite is flying this way, we call this range direction and the orthogonal direction on the ground is called azimuth direction. We call this swath width, and this is the footprint of the radiation. And this is look angle. And we define the 3 dB drop as the, the beam width. Now let's look at this antenna and the Im imaging uh, uh, geometry setting from uh, this direction. And then you will see this is antenna and the radiated beam, uh, 3 dB width is like this. And remember similarity theorem, uh, because the inverse linear relationship, if you lengthen the antenna, the beam width gets narrower and vice versa. Now, if, let's imagine that we wanna resolve these two trees as distinct objects. What do you do? You have to lengthen the antenna. Let's say the, the trees are 15 meters apart. 
In this case, roughly speaking, with C-band, um, you need three kilometer long antenna in space, which is not possible, physically not feasible. Perhaps what we can achieve is 15 meter an antenna in space, then what you get is a three kilometer resolution. You cannot possibly resolve these two trees. Even 15 meter antenna is, is too big to put in space. However, we can utilize a physical property called Doppler effect. I'm sure you have heard about Doppler effect. It's like um, uh, observer A and B, and there's a fire engine coming here, and observer A will hear a higher pitch, and observer B will hear lower pitch than the original source, uh, just like in this sound. Right? Um, you can imagine your past experience of hearing uh, approaching fire engine and and, and when the fire engine passed by, you, you have this Doppler effect. Now that Doppler effect depends on the line of sight component of the, the uh, source and target relative velocity. So let's say this antenna, SAR antenna is flying in this uh, direction to your right. Uh, that means all the targets are relatively uh, flying to your left and the line of sight component of these velocities are like this. So this target right on the track is approaching the antenna the fastest, and as the target gets farther away, uh, perpendicular direction, the line of sight velocity gets reduced. So in color, we uh, express it with a blue shift, and the, the amount of blue shift gets smaller and smaller. Now, this is, uh, you can imagine the same but negative effect for the targets that are uh, getting farther and farther away on this side. So there's this positive and negative symmetry, right? Also, if you imagine more targets below the antenna like this, there's also top and bottom symmetry like this. If you a cone like this, a concentric cone, and we call that equidoppler plane or surface, and this uh, concentric cone is, is, has the, uh, is the collection of all the, all the targets on, in space that has the same Doppler uh, shift. Now, if we cut this in half, and then at the center there's a satellite, uh, but the satellite is in above the ground. If we look at the ground surface, that's going to be intersection of this concentric cone of equidoppler effect. And then, okay, this is these are equidoppler lines, and these are uh, uh, intersection of this plane ground surface. Is, is a parabola, a set of a, a number of parabolas. And then we think about um, the, the places, the locations where um, the, the targets are placed in the same range. We call it equidistance lines. So using, let's say this, uh, this is the satellite and using these two information on the ground, um, that is equidoppler lines that are parabolas and equidistant lines or equirange lines, they're circles, we can distinguish uh, the objects that are closer to each other like this without having to lengthen the antenna. In that case, we synthesize the large aperture as if we have this long antenna to achieve this narrow beam. That's where the synthetic aperture, the word synthetic aperture uh, comes from. And there's a good 
uh, very nice property of that. Um, instead of remember previously we see we saw that uh, the azimuthal re, uh, resolution depends on the distance, uh, but in this case, once you engage synthetic optical radar technique, uh, the resolution azimuthal resolution doesn't depend on the distance anymore. In fact, that so that's just a, a half the length of the antenna. Now, this is the SAR imaging in action. Uh, it's made by JPL. Uh, this is showing the Doppler effect. Uh, the target on the ground, it's a green color, was initially in the blue shift regime, showing the blue shift echo, uh, but having combining multiple pulse echoes, we can increase the az azimuthal resolution. So at first, uh, this image, simulated image, shows that poor resolution in azimuth, azimuth direction. But as we combine more and more uh, pulse echoes, uh, now you can see that the target is in the uh, redshift region. And by combining them, we can achieve high resolution image on the ground, especially in azimuth direction. So this is the end of SAR theory, uh, the imaging mechanism of synthetic aperture radar. Next, I will cover INSAR theory. If you have any questions, please write down in the chat box. So once you acquire SAR image, SAR image is a complex number. Raw data looks like this. Here's a header part and data portion is here. It looks like a noise. But once you do SAR processing, uh, you start seeing features. In this case, it's the Galapagos Island a volcano in Galapagos Island. This is range in azimuth direction. It's a blow up of this area, uh, flank of a volcano, Sierra Negra volcano, which was my PhD study area. And again, uh, SAR image complex numbers, so it has real and imaginary part or amplitude and phase. So let's imagine um, two SAR images acquired on T1 and T2. T1 amplitude is like this, phase, T2 amplitude, and phase. Now phase information, when you look at individual SAR data, is basically white noise. You don't see any information. It's just a <clears throat> random distribution within negative pi and pi range. But once you interfere them, meaning multiply the complex conjugate of the second star image to the first one, you get multiplication of amplitude, but you get phase difference. And then you start seeing some feature. We call this complex interferogram and this phase map, uh, phase difference map, uh, we call that interferometric phase or in short, Interferogram. Now let's look at interferogram in more detail. Interferometric phase has different components. First, let's let's imagine the satellite acquired data at T1, uh, and then at T T2 satellite. We try to put the satellite right back in the same position, but realistically, there's always difference between the two positions. T1 and T2, the satellite position. And as you increase the dis dis distance between the two positions, or we call it baseline, particularly perpendicular baseline, the interference pattern gets denser and denser. And that shows up as a color fringe cycle in interferogram or interferometric phase. So there is that geometric component or baseline dependent component. And the Earth is not perfectly flat, but mm, it's rounded like this. So this interference pattern is modulated by this rounded Earth. On top of that, Earth is not just rounded, but it has topography. So there's further modulation by topography to the interference pattern like this. So existence of topography uh, perturb the shape of this color fringe. 
Okay, so there is topography effect. And that has that is a function of it scales with the perpendicular baseline. And using this property topography, we can generate topography map. That's uh, what I did uh, at JPL uh, using deep space network antenna, uh, 70 meter in diameter and multiple of them. We treated uh, earth like a satellite and moon like earth and created this, generated this uh, moon topography. This is amplitude and this is phase difference that represents topography. And in 2009, back then we generated a lunar DM that was twice as higher resolution, high resolution as the Earth uh, best DM. Back then it was 30 meter, but moon DM of 15 meter was generated for future, to support future lunar mission. Now, that was about topography, but let's look at the uh, displacement component. Let's assume that satellite can magically come back to the exactly same point, or we figure out the geometric, geometry and topography, topography effect and subtract that from that. And what is left is this uh, displacement, but between T1 and T2, let's say there was a construction activity uh, and due to this mass, increased mass, there was subsidence in the, of the ground in this area or groundwater extraction induced ground subsidence. And that shows up as uh, a color fringe as well. And in that case, the one uh, wavelength uh, causes like a full pie of difference in color fringe, uh, or which means one color cycle of two pi difference in color uh, phase difference uh, matches the half the wavelength, uh, lambda over two of the ground displacement. So that's the displacement component. And the measurement precision is not a function of distance. So that's a beauty. It doesn't matter as long as you have a uh, high enough signal to noise ratio, you can measure very precise displacement of the ground from 800 kilometers away using satellite data. And that's what we're doing. And when the microwave signal propagates in the air, uh, the air has a uh, refractive index to this signal. And the biggest function uh, is it depends on the water vapor content in the atmosphere. And you can imagine the water vapor content density uh, has a spatial variation that causes the wiggle of the, the interferogram. And there is a noise, system noise and other noise. Um, and certain type of noise is actually important because uh, we use that for a disaster response. I'll talk about it later um, again. So this is at the end, end of, we're at the end of INSAR theory and I will show you some INSAR applications. Again, if you have any questions, uh, write your questions in the chat box. One application is just to look at the ground uplift and subsidence, in this case, Los Angeles Basin. And this is a, some movie clip that shows the a breathing of the ground in Los Angeles Basin. Um, you can see all these faults that is bounding the breathing extent in here. This is about like uh, plus minus two uh, centimeters uh, of uh, ground uplift and subsidence that you can actually measure from uh, several hundred kilometers away using INSAR technique. And this is seasonal and you can see the seasonally it's going up and down and it can, it's nicely bounded by this fault lines. So you can use it for like a drought induced uh, groundwater change, but it can tell you where uh, the aquifer boundaries are. 
Another example is for earthquake response. This was 2014 South Napa earthquake uh, using Cosmos Sky Med SAR data. We produced this uh, color fringe map that represents the ground displacement, either moving toward or away from the satellite. And if you see this pattern, it shows some clear distinction, discontinuity here. And uh, that happened to match the ground crack. Um, so USGS and California Geological Survey team went out in the field and they confirmed this ground crack right, out, right along this, uh, the INSAR discontinuity. And this happened to be about seven millimeter or so displacements, uh, but it was uh, confirmed on the ground. You can see the N Ashlin type uh, crack on the airport runway and would have been not possible um, if we didn't share, produce and quickly share this uh, ground deformation map with the field crew. Uh, say you can see on the ground along this line, there's a, the uh, ground crack. And this is a typical uh, crack pattern when there's this uh, strike slip faulting occurring. And once you produce this detailed ground displacement, uh, what do you do with it? And uh, one of the common science application is to uh, infer what's causing that deformation. Basically, we go deep and come up with the model and then uh, using that Green's function and uh, that connects the dislocation on the ground and predicts the displacement on the surface. And using this relationship, we can, uh, and using this relationship and a uh, combination of different uh, deformation source model, we can produce um, some, some model that uh, explains the observation on the surface. It may or may not be correct model, but it gives us a prediction capability in what's gonna happen, what, what is likely to happen in the future. So, so that's the value of this modeling effort to explain the surface deformation. One example is here. This is um, what I worked on many years ago about the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. It's the largest volcano on earth and and this volcano was observed by this uh, radar set satellite from four different angles. These are the interferometric, uh, interferometric phase or interferograms. So these are observations from satellites and using this uh, arbitrary dyic and uh, spherical magma source model, we made a prediction on the ground surface. You can see that they're amazingly uh, close to each other, and this is the residual, and this is the profile of the residual where blue is the data, red is the model. And the model runs like this. At the beginning, it's a random shape of uh, dike, and as you run simulated annealing, which is one of the global optimization method, the satellite converts to, uh, the, the dike converts to a certain shape and explains and better and better the observation on the surface. So this is the misfit uh, gets reduced. Uh, we can convert so that we can simultaneously estimate the shape of magma, intruded magma body, and uh, excess magma pressure of that. So using that, we were able to um, calculate the impact, the, the stress change around the intruded magma body and then also uh, predicted, made a prediction of next intrusion, likely next in intrusion um, because of the, the 2005 uh, intrusion, magma intrusion at Mauna Loa. That's, that's one example of application. For earthquake, uh, this, uh, the work we did uh, two years ago and uh, after the California Ridgecrest earthquake occurred in, July 4th, 2019, 
and we again will produce the uh, earthquake. This is the interferogram of the ground displacement caused by the earthquake. Uh, in fact, in this case, 6.4 and magnitude 7.1 earthquakes, uh, the, the combination of two, two major earthquakes. And for this one, we also produce this uh, coherence loss map. Uh, remember, I mentioned uh, certain type of noise are useful. Uh, this is the case. Uh, this basically this coherence is the measure of similarity between two SAR images, and it indicates the level of noise. Um, and we use that noise as our signal to produce uh, what what we call damage proxy map. How much of a ground damage occurred, and this uh, map shows shows that information. Using that information, we've uh, supported a number of uh, more than 100 major disaster events globally for the past 10 years. And this is one example. Um, there was a Hurricane Dorian that hit the Bahamas in September 2019. And using uh, European Space Agency Sentinel-1 data, we produce flood extent map as well as damage um, proxy map. And I work with uh, the science visualization team and produce this figure that was featured in Science Magazine earlier this year. And they also have nice um, uh, featured article about the SAR data. Um, it's a well-balanced SAR uh, data status, like SAR, SAR mission and data usage uh, status. It's a well-balanced article. Because of that, they also uh, named this issue as radar revolution. OK, um, let me try to wrap up. Uh, now that we learned about the applications of SAR and INSAR, this is the same slide. Uh, uh, that I showed you earlier, depending on the different applications. Uh, but now let's look at uh, from different angle, in this case, amplitude versus phase. Um, now, if we look at the amplitude, if you utilize amplitude of SAR images, you can do something like planetary exploration, uh, oil spill detection, or ancient river network. Um, like if you engage long wavelength SAR signals, it can penetrate meters down to arid ground um, and deforestation as well as vehicle speed estimation and ship detection. If you engage topo topography component of interferometric SAR, you can generate topography like uh, tandem X or moon topography. If you look at the displacement component of the interferometric phase, you can generate earthquake or volcanic eruption induced deformation, active landslide or coastal subsidence, even water level change. Uh, if you have enough vertical structure of the vegetation sticking above water, double bouncing effect can let you produce water level change. If you look at the noise and use it as a signal, uh, we can create a damage proxy map caused by a tsunami or storm surge or cyclone or tornado uh, induced wind damage uh, as la or uh, wildfire. To summarize, uh, SAR has all weather and day and night imaging capability. And the important thing is the resolution does not depend on the distance. We, you can, because you're doing, uh, uh, you, you're doing, you're uh, do, engaging synthetic aperture, uh, resolution is irrelevant to the, the range. INSAR um, can measure meter scale elevation and even millimeter scale elevation change at meter scale spacing at tens to even hundreds of kilometers swaths. Um, so it's, it's a very useful tool for 
measuring small scale change over a wide area. Its observations are useful for understanding natural hazards and environmental changes, and its field is growing with more and more sensors put up in the orbit and more and more researchers are looking into the data. Okay, this is the end of the, the instruction part. Uh, just to uh, introduce, briefly introduce the new EOS, Earth Observatory of Singapore Remote Sensing Lab. Uh, we, uh, we just started with uh, three members, uh, my PhD student and mission controller and DevOps lead. Uh, we're four of us for now, um, but we're a very efficient small group and we're looking to hire more people soon. So stay tuned and thank you for your attention. Can I have the first question? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I'm curious about the like a like a the COVID nineteen application. Uh, can you tell us more about like a, what's the discovery or any interesting findings? Uh, what application? Sorry. The COVID nineteen. The oh, COVID nineteen. Right. Um, yes, uh, COVID nineteen is. Uh, Basically, we're using um, basically we're using damage proxy map technique, but we were after a more subtle. So like in Beirut explosion, we have this catastrophic change or wildfire, but COVID-19 induced um, humans response to COVID-19, human activity level changes uh, much more subtle. But basically we engage and enhance the signal to highlight which part, what is the geospatial information, which part of the, the, the land experienced the the disturbance change, which is human activity level. In this case, I think it's showing uh, Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, there's a parking lot there um, because cars are high conductive material. The arrangement of car difference and the lack of car shows up pretty uh, uh, distinctively in the SAR image. So we use um, the thermometric phase information to highlight the locations where human activity level decreased as well as increased to show uh, recovery. We call that recovery proxy map. Um, the first one we call slowdown proxy map uh, versus recovery proxy map. So we used, uh, we generated such maps of 120 major cities around the world. That was our project. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, thank, thank you, Professor Yuan. Uh, any questions more? I got a question. Uh, uh, yes. We heard that um, um, from INSAR, we got a precise result uh, from uh, west to east for the displacement. But it's difficult to estimate to the displacement from uh, south to north. Have you any idea to um, improve the prediction? Mm, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, because in SAR, most of the SAR satellites are sun synchronous. Um, north, it's a polar orbit, meaning that it's orbiting, it's flying from south to north pole and north to south pole of the Earth. The reason is because, uh, because Earth is rotating underneath the satellite, we can, by putting a polar orbit, we can cover the entire Earth, if you want to cover the entire Earth. That's, that's one reason. There's also 
you can make carefully make a process uh, procession to match to make the satellite sun synchronous so the satellite can always look at the sun to maximize the the power uh, generation because it's an active sensor it needs power and you need uh, power storage from the sunlight so that's why sat star satellites carry a solar panel um, because of that and SAR, you saw that it's always side looking. Uh, it's either uh, looking from almost from the east or almost from the west. So you're right, it's, it's uh, sensitive to either east and west components, but not much to south and north components. There are um, ways to, there are uh, developed processing methods to make the, the measurement enhance uh, the measurement north-south components of displacement for example if you split the band you know the SAR signal has uh, uh, the finite width with beam width so if you imagine if you're sp splitting the beam width in azimuth direction first beam and second beam has slightly different look direction in azimuth and you form the interferogram separately and then subtract the two of the beams, set, uh, split beams, then you can retrieve the north-south component. Of course, it's a uh, noise level is higher, but it still shows a north-south component. That's one way. Um, another way is if you engage a lot of uh, satellite look direction, you can actually invert for small north-south uh, directional component, but again, that has uh, a larger noise. Uh, there's another way, which is, uh, if you fly airplane, you can fly airplane east, east, west, and then image uh, north, south, and that would have a north, south component sensitivity. Or you launch a low latitude or equatorial orbit SAR satellite, which actually Singapore is is planning to do for the coming two years, they're, they're planning to launch three SAR satellites in equatorial orbit to make observation. That will have north-south component sensitivity. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Uh, here, uh, one of my, my, our students have a qu one question, please. Hello, Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two questions. The first question is, uh, what were the obstacles you had faced while operating the radar system? And the second question is, uh, what if uh, while operating the radar, if you lose the signal, what will be the counteraction? I mean, how to tackle that? Uh, what's the first question again? Sorry. Uh, what were the obstacles you had faced while operating the radar system? Ah. Um, so radar system, so if I compare radar system uh, with optical system, uh, like I said, it's an active sensor. So one of the obstacles is that um, it needs power, more power than optical system because uh, active system rather than passive system. Um, because it uses power, it also produces heat. So there's a... a heat generation that limits the, the amount of time it operates, it acquires data. We call it duty cycle. The duty cycle is like 10%, um, it acquires data only 10% of the orbit. And that, so certain satellites becomes really hot quickly, so you can continuously operate before the heat, generated heat is dissipated to the safe level. That's one. Uh, another is uh, data downlink. If you have um, satellite ac acquired data and store on board, it has to dump down to some downlink. If the downlink is not dense enough on the ground, um, it will limit the amount of data to be acquired. Um, what else? There are many obstacles, actually. There are many obstacles uh, in, to engineering's point of view. 
uh, but this is yeah to name a couple yeah these are uh, the the obstacles to how when when you operate um, and when you want to acquire more data there's also a, a, a different applications competing each other uh, for example your uh, Fly, your satellite is flying over a volcano. A uh, volcanologist may want to uh, image the volcanic deformation uh, to finer, fine scale with a fine resolution. But then there's a trade off between the mode of uh, high resolution SAR image versus engaging uh, different polarization. If, mm, if there are some, some other scientists want to look at the biomass change in on the volcanic, that volcanic same area, then there's a conflict of interest between this biomass estimation engaging fully polar metric SAR data versus uh, just uh, single pole data with highest resolution. So there are a lot of trade-offs between different applications, also between uh, different uh, engineering reasons and, and application reasons. Professor, uh, my second question is, what if uh, we lose the signal while operating the radar? I mean, uh, what will be the counteraction to tackle that issue? If we lose the signal, for example, the satellite couldn't acquire signal, acquire data. I mean, basically no data, no, no research, but there are, um, there are things such as like, um, the new NISARS technology involves uh, what is called SWEEPSAR. And SWEEPSAR uses, achieves, uh, by using digital beam, beam forming, achieves high resolution and wide swath. But because it's uh, uh, imaging wide swath, um, there's a lot of pulses that it has to transmit. And the receiver part, receiver cannot receive the whole swath of signal because the, the antenna also has to transmit signal in between. And when the antenna is transmitting, you don't want to turn on the receiver because otherwise you will toast the system. Uh, it's, it, the, the signal is too loud and when, if you're listening and shouting at the same time. So you have to turn off. That would produce some inevitable gap inside the data and that's by design, it's a, it's a trade-off. And then that gap can be mitigated you know, by using some brilliant processing technique. For, uh, for example, you can change the PRF, uh, pulse repetition frequency, but and that by doing that, you can uh, move the gap location. And then when you move the gap location, because SAR techniques, processing technique uses uh, uh, compression in range and azimuth direction, you can actually smear out the energy of the echo from neighboring uh, uh, echoes and then uh, interpolate and to fill the gap. Um, maybe I'm talking too much details, but there are technologies to, to uh, compensate such inevitable uh, loss of signal due to the the design of the, the advanced SAR system. Am I answering your question? Professor, I have one question. Uh, what is the role of the deep learning to in complex uh, background SAR images to identify multi-scale targets? What is the role of what? Deep learning. Oh, deep learning. Yes. Uh, deep learning is being used uh, a lot in, in remote sensing area in general, not just SAR, and SAR is not an exception. Uh, compared to optical imagery, deep learning in SAR has one more challenge, which is uh, validation. You need a good label and if you handle optical imagery, it's, it's relatively straightforward because it's more intuitive. But SAR, because it's a different sensor, it's a third eye that we're still trying to understand. 
The star is seeing something. Yes, it penetrates clouds. Yes, yes, you can image at night. But it's a different, very different sensor that utilize like this long microwave rather than like tiny wavelength that our eyes can see. So we first need to translate correctly what radar sees. So translating means uh, having some optical image acquired at the same time and using that, uh, taking advantage of that intuitive remote sensing data, we compare uh, that with the SAR data. Otherwise, there's no, usually like there's no guarantee that what we see is exactly the same as what SAR is seeing. So there's another layer of validation when you prepare the labels. And you know, in deep learning, uh, the quality of labels dictates the quality of your, your deep learning uh, output. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your valuable information. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. So, um, finally, but, but uh, last but not least, uh, we are very impressed. Professor Yuan, today he present so, so, so much uh, amazing presentation material here. Yeah, I, I see not only the content is very important for the begin for the beginner of uh, learning SAR, and but also we uh, Professor Yuan provide a very outstanding uh, experience uh, uh, for his uh, for his uh, previous previous relab relab uh, work. Okay. So here, uh, we we would like to invite if uh, Professor Yuan, you you are available anytime. Uh, you can visit uh, Taiwan and get even we can get some very good uh, joint project together. Special uh, Doctor Nina Nina is she is a very active, a very enthusiastic that that we can go over to each other if you are willing to do that, and we can do some multi-discipline cooperation, for example, WE or geophysics or civil engineering, I see this should be a very fantastic right, uh, idea that we can work together. Okay. Yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, I myself has a joint appointment at WE and Earth Science, yeah. as well as the director of this uh, EOS remote sensing lab. So. I, I will try to build a bridge between WE and Earth Science, and I hope to see the same thing uh, and in collaboration with uh, Taiwan partners, um, including Nina and others. Um, so, and yes, I'm, I'm also very much looking forward to seeing you all in person. Hopefully that they will come soon. And until then, I hope every one of you will stay safe and healthy and happy. Sure. So, so we, we will stay tuned, yeah, and we would like to create some opportunity that, uh, some uh, proposal later. Okay, mm -hmm. today we are, uh, so right now we are running out of, of time, so mm -hmm. uh, let's finally to have a round of a, 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 a pause to appreciate Professor Yuan to deliver his talk today. Okay, thank you again. And see you thank all soon. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, somehow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lina. Thank you, Professor Lau. Thank you, Professor Lau. <laughs> See you later. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, you you will see right away. Um, as we know, you, you are made right now. You are made. Uh, study double E here.